<laughs> Can everybody hear me? Yeah. So I'm all right then. I don't need a microphone or anything. We're, we're good. Um, swivel chairs are bad for me because I'm too rec restless, but I'm going to try to sit and relax. And uh, I was going to say a few things. First, I'm going to time myself because one of the things that I hate when I do these events is talking too much. And it's always bad when you have an event and there's no time for questions. When we do this, uh, <laughs> Dr. John Carlos and I did an event in June in Los Angeles. And we just had a great time up here. And we talked for like an hour or so. And then it was like, OK, there's time for two questions. And there was a room full of like 300 people. And we just felt <laughs> awful that they didn't get a chance to, to speak. Congratulations on your retirement, Williams. It's uh, just said, I'm looking forward to your second act or the conversation that we had in there, your next act. It's, um, it's something that uh, I think about all the time when I was on the baseball beat. They used to call it the divorce beat because we spent so much time on the road and you never got to see anything. You never got to see your family. You never got to see all the stuff because when you cover baseball, you're, you're on the road from about the second week of February until, if your team's good, until Halloween. And so you multiply that by many, many years and you, you miss a lot. So uh, congratulations on being able to see some things that you maybe haven't seen. Um, we were going to talk about the Olympics, and then I started to realize that maybe we should switch gears. Um, we can get to the Olympics, certainly, but um, today is September 11th. And one of the most important things for me in working on this book, when you're conceptualizing a project, I, I always have what I refer to as five steps of anxiety when I do a book. The first step is, do I have an idea? And, and for me, I had an idea. I think that during this time, over the last five years especially, four years if you're going specifically to Ferguson, you started to recognize that there were some things happening in the culture. I think for me, the first thing that I saw, I think it was the 2011 Super Bowl. It was the Ravens and the 49ers. And as we know, Super Bowl ads tell us everything about the culture, right? And so at some point, I was looking at these commercials, and I started to realize that every single commercial was selling America. I was like, OK, so every Super Bowl year, they have some theme. You can tell what the marketers are trying to do to us. They're trying to steer us some way. And in each commercial, there was an American flag, whether you were selling gasoline, whether you were selling a truck, whether you were selling Doritos. There was some symbol there. There was a veteran, there was a flag, there was something that was steering us in this direction. And then by the time you got to Ferguson in 2014, you began to see something else take place, which was athletes doing something that they hadn't done in a very long time, which was to actually say something, to actually speak about the culture that they were living in. And we always say, I used to say in, in my stories that the ball players were so rich that they spend a lot of time hiding behind the tinted glass of their Escalades. And now they're not doing that. All of a sudden, LeBron James, after Trayvon Martin was killed, suddenly he and the Miami Heat are wearing hoodies on the cover of Sports Illustrated. That suddenly you have the, the St. Louis Rams coming out after Ferguson with their hands up, don't shoot. And, and suddenly something was happening. So the first step of my anxiety was, do I have an idea? Clearly, there was an idea happening. Something was happening in the culture. Sports was, was being sold through patriotism. There were symbols that were being used to market products to people. And then, of course, when you watch all the games now, when you watch the games, you can't have a game. Like the you know, NFL Week 1 was last week. You can't start a game without a, an American flag the size of the entire field. I was like, have we forgotten what country we live in? I mean, it's just kind of amazing that you could see all of these symbols. And what do these symbols mean? Every symbol has a meaning. What is being sold to us? What is being told to us by, by this new phenomenon that's taken place? And then the second step of anxiety for me is, after your idea, can you get it? How do you get the idea? It's one thing to have an idea. It's another thing to be able to actually execute it. And so for me, I started to feel like what was taking place was there was some collision taking place in the culture. And it was very difficult to try to figure out what the root of that collision was. I saw something happening, but I didn't know what was happening. When you looked at our coverage and you listened to people talk, 
mostly we concentrated on the black athletes and we compared them to Tommy Smith and John Carlos and Harry Edwards and Kareem and everything that was taking place in 68 and obviously Jackie Robinson and Muhammad Ali and, and the activism from those athletes in the 60s. But I didn't think that was it. I didn't think that was what was really happening. I applauded the connection, but I didn't think that was the only connection. To me, what was really happening was the country has never quite reconciled 9-11. To me, I felt what was really taking place was we have not dealt with everything that took place on that day. And it's certainly generational. And my lovely escort over here, Johanna, brought me over from the hotel. Thank you for that. We had a little conversation on the way over. And I said, what year were you born? And she said, 1997. And I almost passed out, of course. <laughs> Like, really, does it have to be 1997? <laughs> you know, I was like, I was 29 in 1997. And, um, and I started to think about that. You know, you were four years old, or three years old on 9-11. And she's like, I don't remember any of it. And my son was born in 2004. And for that generation, for your generation, this is normal to you. This is what you know. For my generation, the cultural defining moment of our lives was the Cold War. Everything that we did was around the United States and the Soviet Union and nuclear war, whether it was the Olympics, whether it was the TV show, the, the day after, and all of these different things. Our entire lives were shaped by the Cold War, whether it was the, the Americans not going to Moscow in 1980 or the Russians not coming here in 1984. This was the framework. For my father, the framework, of course, was Pearl Harbor. And as we were talking, walking in, my father did not buy a Japanese car until I think we were in high school. I mean, he just wasn't going to do it. I said, but, but you have a Volkswagen. <laughs> <laughs> but these are your frameworks. And so now, when we look at this, and we talk about patriotism, and we talk about what we see when we're watching sports, what messages are being sent to us. And now, obviously, that we get to the place where we are in a situation where you have an administration that is essentially questioning the Americanism and the patriotism and the citizenship of these athletes as well. To me, my step two of this project was you have a collision between post-9-11 America and the post-Ferguson black athlete. That's your story. That's what's happening right now. And how do we deal with that when the power of 9-11, and I was covering the Yankees on 9-11. I was covering, uh, um, goodness, it was Yankees Red Sox that weekend, and then 9-11 was that Tuesday. And so I was living on 49th and 10th, and you, the, the day itself was just, it's one of those days where you will have Memories on top of memories on top of memories on top of things that you've forgotten. And that's just how powerful that, that day was. And what I remember most about 9-11 wasn't actually the day itself, other than the fact that none of the phones worked. Uh, you couldn't make a phone call for forever. I remember two things. I remember, one, even being in sports, because I was one of the few reporters from our paper in New Jersey that lived in Manhattan, so we all had to go to Ground Zero, all hands on deck. Everybody had to be on the coverage team. And I remember that one of the differences between people who were involved immediately from the start and who weren't was their shoes. When people were walking into Ground Zero, into the area, anybody who had new boots, you could tell that they, had, that they weren't there the day before. And then everybody who had been there, they looked they looked pretty messed up because you could see what they, you know, you could just see it. It was, it, was, it was as bad as anything that you could imagine, but also as bad as everything we see in other parts of the world that just didn't happen to us. So I remember coming back to my apartment and walked over just to listen to people. Believe it or not, even though we yell on TV for a living, we're still supposed to listen. And... I remember there was this woman at the bar, and she was talking about how America had it coming. This is on the day. 
this same day, this wasn't September 12th, <laughs> this wasn't October 12th, this was September 11th, about 5.30, 6 o'clock at night, and about the number of missiles that have United States flags on them that kill people. At some point, they were coming to get us, and I could not believe that conversation. And even that, what I really couldn't believe was that nobody attacked her. Everybody was stunned, everybody was listening, and everybody had to pay attention because this wasn't theory anymore. This was real. This country was under attack. And so the second thing I remember about it was months later was that even, even in the spring, even in the new season, 2002, right around 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the winds would change in Manhattan and the winds would blow up north and you could still see little white flakes in the, in the sky. You could still see all that ash coming up the island. And it was all from the towers. And that didn't go away for a couple of years. And so it just gives you an idea, just sort of physically, of what was taking place and what that sort of day did to people who were there. I remember people were showing the, um, the clip of uh, President Bush throwing out the first pitch during the World Series. I remember being at that game and all the snipers on the roofs and everything, and, and then they had the, you know, the funny story, of course, there's always gallows humor and tragedy, right? The, the president had to come out as an umpire because they had to disguise him in case there was an assassination attempt. And all the other umpires are walking down the tunnel and they're looking at the new up and they're like, who's this guy? <laughs> <laughs> Because they couldn't tell, they didn't, they didn't let anybody know that he was going to be there. And so, because everyone was waiting for the president to come in, he was already in the stadium, he was in the umpire's room. And so, you remember all of these things. And we drove to Chicago, the Yankees opened up, everyone remembers the Mets and the, and the Braves opened up in New York when Piazza hits the home run and everybody went crazy and suddenly... New York, a place that everybody hated, was suddenly the center of, of healing. We had to go to Chicago because the Yankees were opening up with the White Sox. Nobody wanted to fly, obviously. So we drove to Chicago. And I remember going to some rest stop in Indiana or somewhere on our way over. And there was this guy who was total redneck dude, looking at me, total city dude. And we would have never spoken or looked at each other at all. I mean, those are the lines in this country so often. And he looked at me, and I looked at him, and he's like, are you all right? I mean, these things never happen. And so it kind of gave you an idea of everybody recognizing that we were in the middle of something very, very different. And maybe it was time for us to put down our swords and pay attention to each other. So over the course of those years, this country changed. And we changed pretty dramatically. And what I found very interesting about where we are today in putting this book together, because step three of my uh, steps of anxiety is doing the work. Step three is my favorite, but it's also the worst part. It's actually doing the work. And so while doing the work, you begin to see the commercialism that overtook the patriotism. And what was taking place during this time was two very important things that we really didn't, and I don't think haven't paid much attention to or enough attention to. One was the fact that the sports leagues themselves recognized there was a marketing opportunity here. There was money to be made in patriotism. There was money to be made in the selling and the packaging of post-9-11 America. And what's actually very funny is that they sing God Bless America and the seventh inning of every baseball game now, and they've been doing it for 17 years now. The reason why they sing God Bless America is not because of 9-11, necessarily. It is because of 9-11, but it's really not. It's because when the towers were hit, the Yanke several Yankee players left town. Roger Clemens left town. Andy Pettit left, Mike Stanton, they all left. They got in a car and they drove to Texas. 
The Mets, on the other hand, had John Franco, Bobby Valentine, a couple New York guys from the city. And Shea Stadium, in the parking lot, they set up a relief area. So the Mets were being considered more patriotic than the Yankees. And George Steinbrenner went crazy that the Yankees were not considered the patriotic team in the city and that the Mets were getting all of this. And if you remember, the Mets were wearing the NYPD hats and the Port Authority hats and the FDNY hats during the game. And the Yankees did not violate Major League rules and they kept wearing their own hats. And so they were getting criticized in New York for not caring as much about 9-11 and about the city as much as the Mets were. And George Steinbrenner would not ever allow the Mets to have anything over the Yankees. So he called Ronan Tynan, who was one of the Irish tenors, to come to New York to, and sing God Bless America during the seventh inning. And everybody copied him. And we've been doing it ever since. That's the reason, was because George didn't want to give in to the Mets. Right? Now I talk to people. I asked a Red Sox executive a few years ago when I was working on the research. I said, it's been 15 years. Why do we still sing God Bless America at these ballparks? And a Red Sox executive told me, I don't know. He says, all I know is that we would get killed if we were the first ones to stop doing it. Nobody wants to be the one to look unpatriotic. I said, so there's no real reason we're doing this except we're just copycatting? That's the reason. Because nobody wants to deal, and especially from this White House, what's going to happen if you look, if you don't look the part. So, so much of what we're doing right now is looking apart. What's it for? The second piece of this that was taking place during this time period was the military recognized that, this, that sports was a tremendous recruiting opportunity. That there's very few other ways to reach 70,000 people sitting in one spot. And fighting two wars, enrollments have been down for years even though despite you had this huge surge in patriotism, the actual number of people who enlisted did not go up very much, if at all. In fact, it's been dropping. And so I had a wonderful conversation with Russell Honore, who's a three-star general who was uh, instrumental in the Katrina cleanup. He and I had a long conversation about this. And he said, listen, only two out of every 10 that qualify we end up getting. And I said to him, well, you know, with all due respect, sir, I'm not sure I want my son recruited just for watching a Red Sox game. He's 12 years old. He just wanted to watch baseball. And he said, well, with all due respect to you, we tell parents to hold on to those little SOBs as long as you can because we need them. They man the force. And if it so turns out, that a 14-year-old who's watching a Dallas Cowboys game sees an F-14 fly over and it motivates them to serve their country, so be it. We need them. So on the one hand, you've got a military imperative. On the other hand, you have sports leagues, multi-billion dollar private industries, who aren't even telling you that this is all paid for that this is advertising. This is not patriotism. This is not an organic outgrowth of supporting the troops on the part of the New England Patriots or the Dallas Cowboys. It's a business deal between public and private, between the Pentagon and the Boston Red Sox. That the Wisconsin National Guard used $80,000 of taxpayer money every year to have a military member sing God Bless America at the ballpark. They're paying for this. And so, what does that say about what's taking place right now? And these are the things that I wanted to talk about. Because this is taking place at a time when the black athlete is paying closer attention to what's taking place in the relationship between 
the black community and the police. And for that attention, they are being called unpatriotic. For that attention, they are being called less than citizens. They're, being, they're having their citizenship questioned. All of this should be questioned. Then, of course, to uh, switch gears a little bit, now you have this Colin Kaepernick situation with Nike getting back involved in rehabilitating him. And so on the one hand, you have one industry, the NFL and professional sports and college sports, and NASCAR and the rest of them, selling patriotism. And then on the other hand, you have another corporation, Nike, selling protest to sell sneakers. Neither of these two things should be for sale. Both are for sale. And both are being sold by massive billion dollar corporations who happen to be business partners. And yet, this undergirding of the conversation is not taking place. Instead, all we're doing is we're questioning the citizenship of the black athlete. That's the conversation we're having. We need to be having different conversations. We need to be having bigger conversations. I, and I think, thank you, and I think, um, you know, and I think one of the things that when you're talking about doing the work, you ask yourself another question. How do I, who do I talk to? How do I get to this idea? Um, <coughs> excuse me. Who can say these things to me? That's what reporting is. You find people who know more than you who can give you a perspective that you need. The veterans themselves were the ones who understood this best. There's a chapter in my book, chapter seven, called Props, where you have the veterans coming out and saying um, very outspokenly and very smartly that if you look at the services that we get coming home, how does that compare to having me go out and throw the first pitch at a baseball game or having an induction ceremony at a football game? We need services, we need help, we need jobs. And we feel like we're being used to sell sports. And we don't necessarily like that. So you have all these different conversations that are taking place within something, which is the, the reason why I thought the book was compelling, because it's all taking place in an, in an arena where we're told there's no politics. There's nothing but politics in this. And especially to bring it full circle, the Olympics is essentially a political event, and it always has been. So for me, as we got closer and closer to putting this project together, on the one hand, you had this idea of stick to sports. This was the thing, shut up and dribble, stick to sports, etc. On the other, you have hundreds of examples where sports were never anything but political. In 2016, ESPN was trying to understand Trump voters. And as you know, we get hammered for being too liberal. And so during the campaign, the company hired uh, Frank Luntz, a Republican pollster, to do a, a focus group and to have people just like in this room, we put images up on the board and would have people respond to them in terms of numbers as they do in these focus groups. And every time there was a picture of a black athlete or a player uh, with an I Can't Breathe t-shirt, or this was before kneeling, obviously, but who showed any sort of um, political attitude, whether it was LeBron James, uh, I don't think Colin Kaepernick was part of it. He might have been. In fact, it might have been closer to the campaign, so it might have been kneeling as well. I don't remember the exact date. The numbers dropped. The Q rating dropped like a stone. And whenever there was a show of a jet or a veteran or a flag or a police officer, the numbers shot up. So they wanted to have a conversation about that. And so... Luntz asked the question, why did your numbers, why were you so negatively reacting to the Colin Kaepernicks and the athletes? And the attitude in the audience was, well, I don't want politics in my sports. We don't want politics in here. We just want the game. And then Frank said, well, 
that's a little hypocritical because the numbers skyrocketed when we showed the American flag and when you showed veterans. And then a woman in the audience said, well, that's not politics, that's patriotism. So people make a distinction. They make a difference between what they view as politics and what they view as patriotism, that to many, many sports fans, they are not the same thing. Even though a national flag is inherently political. So you've got this battle taking place, this cultural battle taking place in a place where we're supposedly told that politics don't matter or that politics are not supposed to matter. It's happening in a place where the Pentagon has decided that this is exactly the place where we need to recruit soldiers. It's happening in a place where the corporations of the National Football League and the National Basketball League and the NCAA and all these have recognized that there's profit also in this. But it's also happening in a time where the athlete, especially the black athlete, is still the product. So you've got a lot of gumbo in here. There's a lot of ingredients to this. And one of the areas that started to strike me was, why is a black athlete so important? I'm like, who cares? I mean, why is it, why does this matter? Why do they matter so much? Because we also ask the question that nobody's asking Aaron Rodgers for his politics. No one's asking Tom Brady for theirs. Why, why does this matter so much? And it hit me that I make the argument in the book that the black athlete is the most important, the most influential, and the most visible black employee this country has ever produced. The black athlete is the one who made it. When you think about where we've gone as a people, the pathway had always been from physical labor to education. And that physical labor to education through college did not come through medicine, did not come through law, it did not come through anything first but sports. Jackie Robinson integrated before the military. The, you know, the SEC and all of these different other, uh, you know, the Pac-10, all the different conferences, the first group of black talent that they went to cultivate were the athletes. And so many times I'm, out, I'm, I'm often asked the question, what would have happened if the HBCUs maintained their black talent? What would have happened to those institutions? Would we be talking about Morehouse and Howard instead of talking about Duke and North Carolina and UCLA. However, these guys are the ones who made it. And because they're the ones who made it in our culture, we look to them to provide leadership. When in other cultures, you look to the leaders, you look to your politicians, you look to your doctors, you look to your lawyers, you look to your middle class and your upper middle class. And then there's something else as well. And it always made me laugh because while I was working on this, I had my friend say to me, are you really going to tell me that, that Michael Jordan is more important than Prince? I'm like, are we really going to do this? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're going to tell me that, you know, that LeBron is more important than Jay-Z? I'm like, well, you're saying that the black athlete's most important. I'm saying that, that the entertainer's more important. And I said, yes, except... And I have to attribute this as well, even though I was thinking about it, I couldn't say it the way he said it. Reverend Al Sharpton was better than me on this one. <laughs> he said, that's true, but they always let us entertain them. He said, if you were, whether you were in the Harlem Renaissance, you could perform at the Cotton Club, even if you couldn't eat there, even if you couldn't go there. But you needed a movement to integrate team sports. That's why the athlete is more important than the entertainer. And when you think about it, we embed that anti-racism and we embed equality and we embed egalitarianism in our speech. We just want a level playing field. So when you think about it that way, you do think about the progression that goes through sports. If we can be on the same team, and we can shower together, and we can turn double plays together, and we can go on the road together, and we stay in hotels together, and we win together, and we lose together as a team, why can't I live next door to you? 
That's very different than having one person on stage singing. So sports has that place. And this is the reason why you can never have a stick to sports attitude, because it has never been that. It's simply a way of muffling and muzzling. And lastly, thank you for all of your patience. And I'll, I will take any questions that you have, but I was going to say that the other piece of this is eventually what we supposedly want is black brain over black body. And when you think about it, even from a university standpoint, it seems to be going backwards. Because now what seems to be happening is that it almost feels as if we've surrendered to the enormous amounts of money and we say, just pay the players. And I'm saying to myself, which I am a proponent of, and we can talk about that too, but why can't we have both? We're still supposed to have both. And that the athlete, especially when you say shut up and dribble and shut up and play, in the culture that we're in right now, the one thing, if we know anything, if we can all agree on anything, it's that whoever has the money gets to talk. If you have money, you can be the mayor of the two biggest cities in the country, Michael Bloomberg, Richard Reardon. You get to be president now by having money. But the people who have the money in sports, what do we say to them? Shut up and play, stick to sports. Why can't they speak? when everybody else who has money gets to speak. We're looking at Mark Cuban and Oprah Winfrey now as presidential candidates because they're rich. But you tell a black athlete to be quiet. So I thought that was worth a conversation. And this is it. So thank you very much. <laughs> yes, ma'am. A lot of tracking. In each race, right? And, you know, when he said that, you know, it kind of made me think about the word talent. And what you just said, it really reminds me of that. Mm -hmm. Right? You know, so, um, you know, when, you know I, I thought it's encouraging to say, or motivational, to say, oh, you're so talented in this. But apparently, according to him, right? It's not the right word to say. Well, I think that there's a, a, a great uh, conversation to be had there about steering. And who are we steering? What are we steering athletes to? And you can see that in sports. Like, for example, one of the things that bothers me is now that we talk about baseball, and there's only, there's only 67 black players in baseball now. I was watching the Red Sox-Yankees game last year. There were 10 of them on, on both teams. I was like, that's... You know, that's almost all of them. <laughs> so um, I was covering the Washington football team. And we were talking about this one day in the, in, the in the locker room. And each one of those players, whether it was Sean Taylor, may he rest in peace, or Santana Moss and Sean Springs, this was a few years ago, and talking to all these players, 
growing up, their favorite sports were, their favorite sport was baseball. They all played baseball growing up. And yet we lament, where are the black baseball players? And we end up blaming the black kid. And we say, oh, well, they'd rather play basketball and football. When actually, the money is in basketball and football. That's where your scholarships go. And I asked them, where did they go? They all aged out of baseball because it was clear that their talent was steering them toward a scholarship in basketball and football. Baseball is 2% African American at the college level. And it's a non-revenue sport. Is baseball non-revenue here, too? Yeah, is baseball non-revenue here? Baseball's not a revenue sport, is it? I don't think so. Yeah, so you're not getting the scholarships here for baseball. And so even though David Price was from here, but still. Um, so now what we're doing with that talent is we're moving it in a place where it can be profited from. So those players are moving toward what's better for them, that allows them to come to the school, and also what's better for the industry, which is, which is the development of that talent. So I've always said if you look for talent, you're going to find it. And right now, Major League Baseball is looking for talent in the Dominican Republic, and they're looking for talent at colleges. You're not going to find black American-born players at either place. To your point, also, if we begin to steer students toward, you know, our African-American students being steered toward science and technology, or are they being steered toward the basketball court? Um, what do we want our culture to look like? Where do we want these athletes to go? Where do we want these kids to go? What are we exposing them to? What do they get? You usually become what you get. And if what you're getting is a basketball, then you're probably going to play basketball, or to the best of your ability, until you can't play it anymore, until you get aged out or somebody's better than you. If you get steered toward an education, you get an education. doesn't mean that it's going to turn into something spectacular, but you're going to be exposed to it. And that's where the college experiment is, was supposed to really work its best magic, which is at the very least, what do they always tell the student athletes? Well, even if you blow your knee out, you're going to be exposed to the college environment. Now we're saying, just pay the players. They're just employees anyway. So it's a really interesting place where we're at right now. Yes, sir? Uh, I got two things. First of all, I really like your food. We did on Hank Henry a few years ago. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Love Henry. And where do you see where Nike and the professional sports are doing since they're in bed with each other, but they both had uh, opposite, um, opposite ideas with each other? Or is this just almost like a coup? <laughs> where they're just like trying to, you know, make, you know, just put a, just, just put a smoke in mirrors and actually shaking hands on the deal and both making money out of it. I think you're right. And I think that I, I've been wrestling with this for a week now since this has happened. And I've been asking myself the question. I follow ideas, I don't follow people. I follow values, I don't follow people. So what's the value lesson being sent here? What's the message? Is the message that Colin Kaepernick can sell jerseys, therefore? Is the message that he was, even when he wasn't in the league, his, he's still one of the top 25 or 30 uh, jersey, in jersey sales. So Nike sees an opportunity. I remember listening to a lot of black people and a lot of progressives a lot of you know, white people and, and anybody else who was, on, who was in support of Kaepernick saying you know, to the NFL, what about us? We support Colin Kaepernick and you're, you know, we watch football, so market to us. So maybe Nike's recognizing that there is a share here. There's a place here. There's a market here. And there's value in that for them. Is there value in that for me? I'm not so sure. However, then I started thinking on it on the other side. I started to think that... You have an entire American culture, a certain segment of this population, that has gone out of its way to destroy this man. Out of its way to take away his livelihood, to take away his ability to earn, to take away his visibility. And now you see people in, I think, was it in Texas, that town in Texas, that are now trying to boycott Nike gear? Louisiana, Louisiana thank you. Um, and that's a municipality. That's not a private business. That is like, I think, uh, like one of the towns. It was one of the city managers was saying this, that we're not going to buy Nike gear. Why are you not going to buy Nike gear? 
What did this man actually do? What did he do? And so when you start thinking about this, now I start to think, on second thought, there is value in just the physical rehabilitation of showing his face, of having him be seen. Because you have, there's a machine right now trying to take away this man's ability to have a life. And I think there's something horribly wrong with that. So even though there's a lot of cynicism about what Nike is doing or what Nike's not doing, I think there's even more cynicism in the desire to take away or to erase Colin Kaepernick as a human being simply because you disagree with what he did. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. I agree with the comment that was made earlier with regards to some of the books that you have written in the past. You mentioned the third point of writing was um, do the work. <laughs> I'd rather not say. <laughs> um, the fourth one is the agony of it all. Did I pull it off? Did I hit the bullseye? You know, then we just drive ourselves crazy in the, you know, the gap between when you hand the book over and when it appears between two covers. Did I say what I wanted to say? And then, of course, the anxiety is number five is what's next. There are three acts that take place when you write a book in terms of ownership. The first act is that the book belongs to you. It's yours. It, it lives in here until it goes from here to the page, until your editor calls and says, let's have it. As we always say, you never finish a book, you just surrender. At some point, you've got to give it to them and let them have it. Second stage is that it belongs to the publisher. And then they can do what they want. Believe it or not, we do not have control over the title. We do not have control over the cover art. We don't have control over how many copies it's, it's, uh, are published or any of that. It's their book. And yes, I appreciate every person who buys one of them because I can't buy a slice of pizza with one book. I get $2.69 per book. So it's a machine on their end. It's their book. And I bring that up because I had a conversation with Frank Robinson when I was working on the Garen book, and I wanted to interview Frank because Frank and Henry were contemporaries, and I wanted to talk to anybody who played against Hank Aaron. And Frank Robinson wouldn't talk to me because Frank was like, hey, man, why should I talk to you? Why do you get to make millions off of my name? I was like, millions? <laughs> <laughs> the third stage of the book is it belongs to you. It's not my book anymore, it's your book. You can read it, you can not read it, you can like it, you can not like it, you can burn it, you can sell it, you can do whatever you want with it. It's not mine anymore. And that's also the hard part, where your idea, there's an arrogance that comes with doing a book that feeling like you have something to say that other people should listen to. And these are the stages of that. Yes, sir. I've got a question, and I want to end up at a discussion of Dak Prescott and Jerry Jones and patriotism. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to start by saying, my wife and I have a son who's in the Navy. Mm -hmm. I also lost a relative in 9-11. Mm -hmm. And so that whole question sure. of black folk and patriotism is really interesting. And what I see happening with Dak Prescott in particular is working as I do in the community with a lot of progressives, I've dealt with a lot of black folk who are demonizing Dak. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, but that's what we did to George Foreman. He's also, mm -hmm. so can you talk a little about Dak? Oh, absolutely. And if anybody doesn't know the, uh, the George Foreman story, during the Smith Carlos Olympics and the Olympic boycott and whether or not the black athletes were going to go to Mexico City in 1968, George Foreman, of course, did go. And not only did he go, but he went out and when he won, he was waving the tiny American flags. It was sort of his way of saying, I'm not with this. I'm my own person. And this is where I agree. <laughs> and he did get demonized. And when you talk about Dak Prescott, you know, Dak Prescott said there's more to activism than kneeling. You can't just take a knee. Um, I'm going to try to do this quickly because okay. um, there's a lot to it. I have a major, major problem with Dak Prescott and I have a major problem with Malcolm Jenkins and I have a major problem with the Players Coalition. I have a major problem with all of this. And the reason is not because I think they're sellouts and I think it's a horrible thing to say. One of the worst things you could ever say to a black person is to call them a sellout. 
I don't think Malcolm Jenkins is a sellout. I think Malcolm Jenkins cares very deeply for his people and for the world. I believe that when you look at what he does. I have a problem with Malcolm Jenkins' tactics. The owners of the National Football League went out of their way to deny employment to a qualified athlete. And his own players in the same union went into business with those people. My issue with that is a labor question. These guys have lied to you on concussions. They've lied to you on safety. They're taking money from you in terms of you don't have guaranteed contracts when you play the sport where you're at risk the most. In the middle of labor negotiation, as we all know, you give to this, you take from that, you win this, you lose that. It's a negotiation. How on earth can you go into business with people who blackballed one of your own as a first option? These guys are mega rich people. They're super rich people. I mean, like, one of my favorite stories was I was, I was, I was at Yankee Stadium one day, and I was talking to Alex Rodriguez. And he was talking about, well, you know, I was talking to Warren Buffett about this the other day. I was like, stop right there. <laughs> The point being, there's a lot of money out there. And if you want $89 million or $90 million or $50 million, go out and raise it. And you raise that money and you walk over to the owners and you say, we can do this without you. You are our adversaries because you did this to one of ours. And also because you lied to us on concussions and because we don't have guaranteed contracts. So that's my issue with that. When it comes to DAC, my issue with Dak and my issue with the McCordys and my issue with Malcolm Jenkins on that side is I believe that they're trying to have it both ways. To say that you have to do more than take a knee or taking a knee is not enough is insulting to me and it is insulting to the entire history of the civil rights movement in that symbolic protest has value. Nobody cares that Malcolm Jenkins is at the legislature trying to get police reform. It's important that he's there. But what got people moving was Colin Kaepernick taking a knee. That's what got them moving. What got you that $89 million? What moved this forward? You need both. And what I don't like about what the players are doing is the players are making it seem they are devaluing symbolic protest. They are devaluing the one thing that every person in power fears, and that is people in the street. That is what moves cultures. Working within the legislature doesn't move culture. Working within the legislature maintains the culture. But go put 200,000 people out in the street or down in Washington, and all of a sudden everybody's moving. Put those kids out there from Parkland out in the street, and suddenly, suddenly we need to talk. So for the players, to do this, I think they're pawns. I think they're acting like pawns. I think Dak Prescott is acting like a pawn. And I think Dak Prescott has two problems, in my opinion. Problem one is you need to open up a book. <laughs> Problem number two is if you're going to say that there's more to it than taking a knee, where's your resume? What have you done, Dak? I'm just asking. You know what I mean? I'm just asking. So to me, I think the players do themselves a great disservice. And I think one of the reasons why they're doing it is because they're not all in. They're not really down. They're afraid. Black players are running for their lives right now. I mean, does anybody know, this, you know the name Metacomet? You know, King Philip, you know, the, in, in Plymouth, in the Pilgrims, you know, he, was, uh, he started a, a, a war with the, with the Pilgrims. You know, it's essentially like Braveheart. They took King Philip, they killed him, they stuck his head on a stake and put it in the town square to let everybody know as a warning. Colin Kaepernick is that warning. So you can't be in and out at the same time. And so I think what the players need to do is the players, the players need to keep doing what they're doing. And not everybody wants to go out in the street, and nobody's saying that you have to. But you can't demonize going out into the street. You can't say that this has no value or that somehow you're more elevated, you know, that, that protest is somehow beyond you. Because it's not. 
And whenever you look around the world and you look at uprisings, what do you see? You see people in the street. So when people talk to me about the resistance, I laugh at them. Because I don't see a lot of people in the street in the United States. Yes, sir. Majority partner. Yeah. Yeah. Where do you think that point would ever come to be? Somebody asked me not too long ago, where do I see the future of the heritage? Where do I, is it possible, and I've been asking myself this question over and over again, is it possible to be in the pantheon of LeBron, I'm sorry, LeBron, in the pantheon of Paul Robeson and Jackie Robinson and Muhammad Ali and Smith and Carlos and all these guys who took a risk? This heritage is not a club you want to join. I mean, and you look at, I said, the heritage is not a club you want to join. Every single one of these guys who put something out there, they paid. They paid big. They lost everything. And the only reason we talk about Muhammad Ali right now is because he got his title back. It's because he had enough ability to come back and win. If he didn't, we wouldn't be having the conversation about him. And somebody said to me, and I find it ironic that Colin Kaepernick took his knee two and a half months after Muhammad died. And yet people talk about Muhammad as this great, you know, this great person, this great humanitarian, this great symbol of everything. Y'all hated him. I mean, really hated him. And somebody said to me, well, how, what is the dichotomy here? What is the difference? How can you have, why do we love Muhammad so much, but we don't love Colin? I said, because Muhammad's dead. <laughs> and because he couldn't talk for 30 years. That's, he didn't, he wasn't a threat anymore. And also, Muhammad indicted somebody else's generation and didn't indict yours. Colin Kaepernick is indicting you. He's indicting your relationship with law enforcement. So you can't run from Colin. You can't look and say, oh, well, you know, um, that wasn't me. I wasn't born. Yeah, you, you're right here. Now, of course, with this whole Nike deal, I'm wondering about that. So it just keeps going. To answer your question, can you... Join this heritage by wearing a t-shirt. Can you be part of this heritage by having Nike do commercials for you? Can you be part of this heritage when you're LeBron James and your net worth is $500 million and you are business partners with AT&T and T-Mobile and State Farm and all of these corporations? How can you protest who you are? You're protesting yourself. You are the power now. So maybe what we're really talking about is a bit of a detour into this thing that maybe what you're doing, I talked to Carmelo Anthony about this in the book, and Carmelo is mad about this. Carmelo believes that over Donald Sterling, when he said those things about Magic Johnson, and when they boycotted, and they threw their, you know, the Clippers threw their shirts in the middle of the court, they're like, what did that do? We had an opportunity right there not to play. And he said, if it were me, I wouldn't have played, we would have boycotted the playoffs. I said, yeah, but your team didn't make the playoffs, Carmelo. <laughs> <laughs> but there, to him, there was a power opportunity there. And what the players did was the players trusted Adam Silver. They trusted the system to include it. I believe that the reason why LeBron James is as valuable as he is, is I believe that LeBron's endgame, this is just my, you know, mad doctoring going on here, but I believe that LeBron James's point is to your point that you're gonna have team, player-owned teams, that you're gonna have a shift in the equity, that these guys are making enough money now, if they really want to, to create something different. I mean, Hank Aaron topped out at 240,000. That was the highest salary he ever made, it was $240,000. LeBron James makes 35 and a half million. You know, I mean, and so when you start looking at the raw dollars that these guys have, they have a possibility to really do something different. Of course, when I asked Carmelo about this, his other point was most guys, they were happy getting a check for $12 million and not having to put anything up. So when and if they get to a point when they're willing to put something up, you'll see some change. But as of now, you don't have black ownership in the NFL. You have Michael Jordan owning in basketball. Derek Jeter's got a 4% stake in the, Mar in the Marlins in baseball, and that's it. Um, Serena's got a half a percent or two percent of the uh, Dolphins. 
But to get to that point where you have real black ownership in this game, I mean, the dollars are staggering. I mean, you're not in the same category. Like, for example, everybody was talking about this Steph Curry-Jay-Z connection that's, you know, Jay-Z is worth $700 million and Steph can put in a couple hundred million. The Panthers went for $2 billion. I mean, so you're in different finding. And so as much money as we talk about with the players, ownership is in a different category. One quick funny story about this was when Michael Jordan was playing baseball and everybody was all upset about the fact, you know, the, the, the Chicago Bulls, as we know, that one of the reasons why the Bulls broke up was because both Jerry Krause and Jerry Reinsdorf were incredibly jealous of Michael Jordan. They were just so jealous of Michael because he was Michael, right? And so one day they were talking about ownership and, and they were talking about, you know, the greatness of Michael Jordan or whatever and, and all the money that Jordan has. And one day... Reinsdorf had just gotten so sick of this. He said, you know the difference between me and Michael? Nobody signs my check. <laughs> okay, so now we know who's boss. <laughs> right? So the, the point is, is that one day the players have to accumulate this sort of money. They're not anywhere close to that sort of money. I mean, Magic Johnson wrote a check for $50 million to get a piece of the Dodgers. Right? He's got a piece of the Dodgers. He's got 50 million of a 2.2 billion dollar sale. He's not even in the same ballpark. <laughs> right? Exactly. But, but equity-wise, it's a step. It's a step. Yes, sir. Curious about your take on Serena Williams and the the activities of the past week. All right. Turn that camera off. <laughs> <laughs> Black women are leaving before I can even talk about Serena. All I can say is thank you for that question, right? Wow. Um, lots of layers here. Um, number one, the... It's like walking on a minefield. Okay. <laughs> Number one, the greatest value of privilege is for everything to be an isolated incident, is to be able to look at everything as objective and pure and devoid of context. It's just a tennis match. When you are the aggrieved, when you're black, when you're the minority, when you're the aggrieved, when you're the poor, you view this you view everything that takes place as an accumulation of everything I've been putting up with for all these years. There are no isolated incidents when you're in that category. So when you're Serena and this is happening to you, you say, this is 2004 with the bad call against Henan. This is 2009 in the semifinals of the US Open when she did say she was going to shove the ball down the throat of a ref, but she did <laughs> say that, and got fined $82,000 when Jimmy Connors called a referee an abortion and didn't even lose a point. It's 2011 when she got called for the hindrance in the final against Stozer. It's all those years when everybody accused her family of essentially fixing matches between Venus and Serena. It's Ily Nastasi calling her a man. It's the French Federation attacking her cat suit just a couple weeks to start the tournament. It's all of the above, and that tea kettle starts to whistle. Whereas to us, we're like, well, she broke the rules of the tennis match, and the rules are the rules, right? To her, and to everybody watching this who feels the way she feels, it's why are you doing this to me over and over and over and over again. You've gone out of your way to destroy me when I'm the best this sport has ever produced. I am one of the greatest athletes in the world. I get no dispensation. I'm sick of it. And she popped. And there's value in that because it's true. On the other hand, she did talk to the ump like he was a child. 
So now I just say to people all the time, you owe me an apology, say it, say it, say it, say you're sorry. I was like, I'm just going, you know, okay. But what she was really saying was, you don't do this to any other great players. Why are you constantly doing this to me? The other, have one more question? Oh, good. See that? I was waiting for someone to tell me because we could just keep going, right? <laughs> so the, the point of it is also was she is also, you know, when she started looking at the, the chair up and she said, I am a mother. I'm like, so what? You know, this is a match. I mean, this is, the rules are the rules. You broke a tennis racket, so therefore that's a point penalty. But what she was saying also when watching this is, I was like, she believes her commercials now. I mean, she is a symbol. So now you have this conversation, as we were talking earlier, is what happens when the person becomes the symbol? She is symbolizing grievance. And that grievance is being felt by a lot of people who watch that. At the same time, she also got her ass kicked. <laughs> because Naomi Osaka balled out on her. And I think that if she was out there, if she was up 6231, then none of this happens. She could feel it slipping away, and the pressure of having to be everything to everybody and to make history and to keep winning and to be the first mother, you know, since Kleister's to win and to, to be the inspiration and to also sell and sell because nobody, has, nobody has, has marketed their motherhood like this. I mean, all of the above, you got a perfect storm on Saturday. Thank you. Very, very, very timely. Um, you know, the title, I'm, I'm curious as to how you got the title, how you came about manufacturing and conjuring up, but uh, praying for it, but I have, you got to it. Um, and then I want you to juxtapose what the heritage meant to, and you spoke about Paul Robinson mm -hmm. and the culture then, versus what the heritage is in the culture that we live in now. Yep. The title of the book. The original title of the book was War Games, which is the sec chapter two of the book, which is section two of the book. The entire book, was, it was supposed to be, it was War Games, and it was all about what was taking place in terms of patriotism versus the, the Freddie Gray Ferguson period. Publisher didn't like that title because it reminded them of the Matthew Broderick movie in the 80s. <laughs> and also, see what I mean about how much control they've got, right? But they, I think they were right on this. And also because they didn't think that the title War Games addressed addressed the, um, the heritage. It didn't address the Ali Robeson history of black athletic protest. So that title didn't quite fit both, and I got it. I was like, okay, and they're like, well, is there a word or is there something? You know, they were like, how about legacy? I'm like, no, I hate that word, and plus everyone uses it poorly. They use it wrong. And um, they said, well, is there something that keeps coming up? So every interview that I did, whether I was talking to Dusty Baker or Hattery Edwards or Al Sharpton, they all kept talking about this inheritance, this heritage, this is our heritage. And it kept coming up. And then when it really hit me as a title was when Dr. Harry Edwards was talking about Tiger Woods. And he was talking about Tiger and this whole Cablin Asian fiasco about how Tiger not accepting his blackness and Tiger not embracing his blackness. And by not embracing his blackness, he had no heritage to go back to. And I was like, that's it. And then he also said, and when, you know, he said, he said when, when Tiger got arrested for the DUI, Cablin Asian wasn't on the police report, was it? <laughs> um, and you know, the last question was about Paul Robeson, was about the juxtaposition of Robeson, of culture. This is one of the hardest parts in that you never want to diminish anybody's experience. And Colin Kaepernick has paid an enormous price for what he did. Colin Kaepernick also had 25, 30, 35 million dollars in the bank of, you know, guaranteed money. Paul Robeson got destroyed by the United States government to the point where he was essentially erased. If you read the New York Times obit of him in 1976, 75, 76. It was so filled, you could tell that whoever wrote that was like, I don't want to write a single word of this. I mean, he was destroyed, which is similar to what you see some of these organizations doing to Kaepernick now, that they, don't, they want to deny everything of him. So that's why I thought it was really important to revive Paul Robeson. One of the things that one of 
my favorite people, and he would never accept me calling him a mentor, but I consider him one. Your father, David, said to me a long time ago, he said it to everybody, but I thought he was talking to me directly. <laughs> he was in the middle of an auditorium at UMass, had a bad back at the time, was really struggling, but he hung in there. And he said, history writes people out of the story, and it's our job to write them back in. And so that's why I thought it was really important to start this book with Paul Robeson. Because when you compare what is happening, what happened to Robeson, and what's happening right now, where you do have a government, you have a government that has gone out of its way to destroy an individual. I mean, let's not forget, Ruth Bader Ginsburg went out and called Colin Kaepernick dumb. You know, so there's a lot of feelings, you know, and she had to apologize because we all apologize now when we get caught. But, um, you know, but when we think about this, how different is it? And so the power of the individual is becoming less and less and less, and it was never very big in the first place, as the power of the corporation and the power of the government and the power of the government and the corporation become one in this age of privatization. You know, what chance do you have? And how different is that than doing, you know, than what happened to, to Paul Robeson back in the 1940s. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Did I go on too long? I didn't mean to go on too long. How long did I go? Frank Aaron book, and I wanted to interview Frank because Frank and Henry were contemporaries, and I wanted to talk to anybody who played against Hank Aaron. And Frank Robinson wouldn't talk to me because Frank was like, hey man, why should I talk to you? Why do you get to make millions off of my name? I was like, millions? <laughs> The third stage of the book is it belongs to you. It's not my book anymore, it's your book. You can read it, you can not read it, you can like it, you can not like it, you can burn it, you can sell it, you can do whatever you want with it. It's not mine anymore. And that's also the hard part, where your idea, there's an arrogance that comes with doing a book that feeling like you have something to say that other people should listen to. And these are the stages of that. Yes, sir. I've got a question, and I want to end up at a discussion of Dak Prescott and Jerry Jones and the Patriots. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to start by saying that my wife and I have a son who's in the Navy. Mm -hmm. I also lost a relative in 9-11. Mm -hmm. And so that whole question sure. of black folk and patriotism is really interesting. And what I see happening with Dak Prescott in particular is working as I do in the community with a lot of progressives, I've dealt with a lot of black folk who are demonizing Dak. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, but that's what we did to George Foreman. Also, mm -hmm. so can you talk a little about Dak? Oh, absolutely. And if anybody doesn't know the uh, the George Foreman story, during the Smith Carlos Olympics and the Olympic boycott, and whether or not the black athletes were going to go to Mexico City in 1968, George Foreman, of course, did go. And not only did he go, but he went out. And when he won, he was waving the tiny American flags. It was sort of his way of saying, "I'm not with this. I'm my own person, and this is where I agree." This is. And he did get demonized. And when you talk about Dak Prescott, you know, Dak Prescott said there's more to activism than kneeling. You can't just take a knee. Um, I'm going to try to do this quickly because um, there's a lot to it. I have a major, major problem with Dak Prescott. And I have a major problem with Malcolm Jenkins. And I have a major problem with the Players Coalition. I have a major problem with all of this. And the reason is not because I think they're sellouts, and I think it's a horrible thing to say. One of the worst things you could ever say to a black person is to call them a sellout. I don't think Malcolm Jenkins is a sellout. I think Malcolm Jenkins cares very deeply for his people and for the world. I believe that when you look at what he does. I have a problem with Malcolm Jenkins' tactics. The owners of the National Football League went out of their way to deny employment to a qualified athlete. And his own players in the same union went into business with those people. My issue with that is a labor question. These guys have lied to you on concussions. They've lied to you on safety. They're taking money from you in terms of you don't have guaranteed contracts when you play the sport where you're at risk the most. In the middle of labor negotiation, as we all know, you give to this, you take from that, you win this, you lose that. It's a negotiation. 
how on earth can you go into business with people who blackballed one of your own as a first option? These guys are mega rich people. They're super rich people. I mean, like, one of my favorite stories was I was, I was, I was at Yankee Stadium one day, and I was talking to Alex Rodriguez. And he was talking about, well, you know, I was talking to Warren Buffett about this the other day. I was like, stop right there. <laughs> The point being, there's a lot of money out there. And if you want $89 million or $90 million or $50 million, go out and raise it. And you raise that money and you walk over to the owners and you say, we can do this without you. You are our adversaries because you did this to one of ours. And also because you lied to us on concussions and because we don't have guaranteed contracts. So that's my issue with that. When it comes to DAC, my issue with DAC and my issue with the McCordys and my issue with Malcolm Jenkins on that side is I believe that they're trying to have it both ways. To say that you have to do more than take a knee or taking a knee is not enough is insulting to me and it is insulting to the entire history of the civil rights movement in that symbolic protest has value. Nobody cares that Malcolm Jenkins is at the legislature trying to get police reform. It's important that he's there. But what got people moving it was Colin Kaepernick taking a knee. That's what got them moving. What got you that $89 million? What moved this forward? You need both. And what I don't like about what the players are doing is the players are making it seem they are devaluing symbolic protest. They are devaluing the one thing that every person in power fears, and that is people in the street. That is what moves cultures. Working within the legislature doesn't move culture. Working within the legislature maintains the culture. But go put 200,000 people out in the street or down in Washington, and all of a sudden everybody's moving. Put those kids out there from Parkland out in the street, and suddenly, suddenly we need to talk. So for the players, to do this, I think they're pawns. I think they're acting like pawns. I think Dak Prescott is acting like a pawn. And I think Dak Prescott has two problems, in my opinion. Problem one is you need to open up a book. <laughs> Problem number two is if you're going to say that there's more to it than taking a knee, where's your resume? What have you done, Dak? I'm just asking. You know what I mean? I'm just asking. So to me, I think the players do themselves a great disservice. And I think one of the reasons why they're doing it is because they're not all in. They're not really down. They're afraid. Black players are running for their lives right now. I mean, does anybody know, this, you know the name Metacomet? You know, King Philip, you know, the, in, in Plymouth, in the Pilgrims, you know, he, was, uh, he started a, a, a war with the, with the Pilgrims. You know, it's essentially like Braveheart. They took King Philip, they killed him, they stuck his head on a stake and put it in the town square to let everybody know as a warning. Colin Kaepernick is that warning. So you can't be in and out at the same time. And so I think what the players need to do is the players, the players need to keep doing what they're doing. And not everybody wants to go out in the street, and nobody's saying that you have to. But you can't demonize going out into the street. You can't say that this has no value or that somehow you're more elevated, you know, that, that protest is somehow beyond you. Because it's not. And whenever you look around the world and you look at uprisings, what do you see? You see people in the street. So when people talk to me about the resistance, I laugh at them. Because I don't see a lot of people in the street in the United States. Yes, sir. Majority partner. Yeah. Where do you think that's going to ever come to be? Somebody asked me not too long ago, where do I see the future of the heritage? Where do I, is it possible, and I've been asking myself this question over and over again, is it possible to be in the pantheon of LeBron, I'm sorry, LeBron James, in the pantheon of Paul Robeson and Jackie Robinson and Muhammad Ali and Smith and Carlos and all these guys who took a risk? 
this heritage is not a club you want to join. I mean, and you look at, I said, the heritage is not a club you want to join. Every single one of these guys who put something out there, they paid. They paid big. They lost everything. And the only reason we talk about Muhammad Ali right now is because he got his title back. It's because he had enough ability to come back and win. If he didn't, we wouldn't be having the conversation about him. And somebody said to me, and I find it ironic, that Colin Kaepernick took his knee two and a half months after Muhammad died. And yet people talk about Muhammad as this great you know, this great person, this great humanitarian, this great symbol of everything. Y'all hated him. I mean, really hated him. And somebody said to me, well, how, what is the dichotomy here? What is the difference? How can you have, why do we love Muhammad so much, but we don't love Colin? I said, because Muhammad's dead. <laughs> and because he couldn't talk for 30 years. That's, he, didn't, he wasn't a threat anymore. And also, Muhammad indicted somebody else's generation and didn't indict yours, Colin Kaepernick is indicting you. He's indicting your relationship with law enforcement. So you can't run from Colin. You can't look and say, oh, well, you know, um, that wasn't me. I wasn't born. Yeah, you, you're right here. Now, of course, with this whole Nike deal, I'm wondering about that. So it just keeps going. To answer your question, can you join this heritage by wearing a T-shirt? Can you be part of this heritage by having Nike do commercials for you? Can you be part of this heritage when you're LeBron James and your net worth is $500 million and you are business partners with AT&T and T-Mobile and State Farm and all of these corporations? How can you protest who you are? You're protesting yourself. You are the power now. So maybe what we're really talking about is a bit of a detour into this thing that maybe what you're doing, I talked to Carmelo Anthony about this in the book, and Carmelo is mad about this. Carmelo believes that over Donald Sterling, when he'd said those things about Magic Johnson, and when they boycotted, and they threw their, you know, the Clippers threw their shirts in the middle of the court, they're like, what did that do? We had an opportunity right there not to play. And he said, if it were me, I wouldn't have played, we would have boycotted the playoffs. And I said, yeah, but your team didn't make the playoffs, Carmelo. <laughs> But there, to him, there was a power opportunity there. And what the players did was the players trusted Adam Silver. They trusted the system to include it. I believe that the reason why LeBron James is as valuable as he is, is I believe that LeBron's endgame, this is just my, you know, mad doctoring going on here, but I believe that LeBron James's point is to your point, that you're going to have team player-owned teams, that you're going to have a shift in the equity, that these guys are making enough money now, if they really want to, to create something different. I mean, Hank Aaron topped out at $240,000. That was the highest salary he ever made, $240,000. LeBron James makes $35.5 million. You know? I mean, and so when you start looking at the raw dollars that these guys have, they have a possibility to really do something different. Of course, when I asked Carmelo about this, his other point was, most guys, they were happy getting a check for $12 million and not having to put anything up. So when and if they get to a point when they're willing to put something up, you'll see some change. But as of now, you don't have black ownership in the NFL. You have Michael Jordan owning in basketball. Derek Jeter's got a 4% stake in the, Mar in the Marlins in baseball, and that's it. Um, Serena's got a half a percent or 2% of the uh, Dolphins. But to get to that point where you have real black ownership in this game, I mean, the dollars are staggering. I mean, you're not in the same category. Like, for example, everybody was talking about this Steph Curry-Jay-Z connection. That's, you know, Jay-Z is worth $700 million and Steph can put in a couple hundred million. The Panthers went for $2 billion. I mean, so you're in different finding. And so as much money as we talk about with the players, ownership is in a different category. One quick funny story about this was when Michael Jordan was playing baseball and everybody was all upset about the fact that you know, the, the, the Chicago Bulls, as we know, that one of the reasons why the Bulls broke up was because both Jerry Krause and Jerry Reinsdorf were incredibly jealous of Michael Jordan. They were just so jealous of Michael because he was Michael, right? And so one day they were talking about ownership and, and they were talking about you know, the greatness of Michael Jordan or whatever. 
and, and all the money that Jordan has. And one day, Reinsdorf had just gotten so sick of this, he said, you know the difference between me and Michael? Nobody signs my check. <laughs> okay, so now we know who's boss. <laughs> right. So the, the point is, is that one day the players have to accumulate this sort of money. They're not anywhere close to that sort of money. I mean, Magic Johnson wrote a check for $50 million to get a piece of the Dodgers, right? He's got a piece of the Dodgers. He's got $50 million of a $2.2 .2 billion sale. He's not even in the same ballpark. <laughs> right? Exactly. But, but equity-wise, it's a step. It's a step. Yes, sir? Curious about your take on Serena Williams and the Empire <laughs> and the activities of the past week. All right, turn that camera off. <laughs> <laughs> Black women are leaving before I can even talk about Serena. All I can say is thank you for that question, right? <laughs> wow. Um, lots of layers here. Um, number one, the... It's like walking on a minefield, okay. <laughs> number one, the greatest value of privilege is for everything to be an isolated incident, is to be able to look at everything as objective and pure and devoid of context. It's just a tennis match. When you are the aggrieved, when you're black, when you're the minority, when you're the aggrieved, when you're the poor, you view this, you view everything that takes place as an accumulation of everything I've been putting up with for all these years. There are no isolated incidents when you're in that category. So when you're Serena, and this is happening to you, you say, this is 2004 with the bad call against Henan. This is 2009 in the semifinals of the US Open when she did say she was going to shove the ball down the throat of a ref, but she did <laughs> say that, and got fined $82,000 when Jimmy Connors called a referee an abortion and didn't even lose a point. It's 2011 when she got called for the hindrance in the final against Stozer. It's all those years when everybody accused her family of essentially fixing matches between Venus and Serena. It's Ily Nastasi calling her a man. It's the French Federation attacking her cat suit just a couple weeks to start the tournament. It's all of the above. And that tea kettle starts to whistle. Whereas to us, we're like, well, she broke the rules of the tennis match and the rules are the rules, right? To her and to everybody watching this who feels the way she feels, it's why are you doing this to me over and over and over and over again? You've gone out of your way to destroy me when I'm the best this sport has ever produced. I am one of the greatest athletes in the world. I get no dispensation. I'm sick of it. And she popped. And there's value in that because it's true. On the other hand, she did talk to the ump like he was a child. So now I just say to people all the time, you owe me an apology. Say it. Say it. Say it. Say you're sorry. I was like, I'm going, you know, okay. But what she was really saying was, you don't do this to any other great players. Why are you constantly doing this to me? The other, I have one more question? Oh, good. See that? I was waiting for them to tell me because we could just keep going, right? <laughs> so the, the point of it is also was she is also, you know, when she started looking at the, the chair up and she said, I am a mother. I'm like, so what? You know, this is a match. I mean, this is, the rules are the rules. You broke a tennis racket, so therefore that's a point penalty. But what she was saying also when watching this is, I was like, she believes her commercials now. I mean, she is a symbol. 
So now you have this conversation, as we were talking earlier, is what happens when the person becomes the symbol? She is symbolizing grievance. And that grievance is being felt by a lot of people who watch that. At the same time, she also got her ass kicked. <laughs> because Naomi Osaka balled out on her. And I think that if she was out there, if she was up 6231, then none of this happens. She could feel it slipping away. And the pressure of having to be everything to everybody and to make history and to keep winning and to be the first mother you know, since Kleister's to win and to, to be the inspiration and to also sell and sell because nobody, has, nobody has, has marketed their motherhood like this. I mean, all of the above, you got a perfect storm on Saturday. Thank you. Very, very, very timely. Um, you know, the title, I'm, I'm curious as to how you got the title, how you came about manufacturing, conjuring up, but, uh, praying for it, but I have, you got to it. Um, and then I want you to juxtapose what the heritage meant to, and you spoke about Paul Robeson mm -hmm. and the culture then, versus what the heritage is in the culture that we live in now. Yep. The title of the book. The original title of the book was War Games, which is the sec chapter two of the book, which is section two of the book. The entire book, was, it was supposed to be, it was War Games, and it was all about what was taking place in terms of patriotism versus the, the Freddie Gray Ferguson period. Publisher didn't like that title because it reminded them of the Matthew Broderick movie in the 80s. <laughs> and also, see what I mean about how much control they've got, right? But they, I think they were right on this. And also because they didn't think that the title War Games addressed addressed the, um, the heritage. It didn't address the Ali Robeson history of black athletic protest. So that title didn't quite fit both, and I got it. I was like, okay, and they're like, well, is there a word or is there something? You know, they were like, how about legacy? I'm like, no, I hate that word, and plus everyone uses it poorly. They use it wrong. And um, they said, well, is there something that keeps coming up? So every interview that I did, whether I was talking to Dusty Baker or Hattery Edwards or Al Sharpton, they all kept talking about this inheritance, this heritage, this is our heritage. And it kept coming up. And then when it really hit me as a title was when Dr. Harry Edwards was talking about Tiger Woods. And he was talking about Tiger and this whole Cablin Asian fiasco about how Tiger not accepting his blackness and Tiger not embracing his blackness. And by not embracing his blackness, he had no heritage to go back to. And I was like, that's it. And then he also said, and when, you know, he said, when, when Tiger got arrested for the DUI, Cablin Asian wasn't on the police report, was it? <laughs> um, and you know, the last question was about Paul Robeson, was about the juxtaposition of Robeson of culture. This is one of the hardest parts in that you never want to diminish anybody's experience. And Colin Kaepernick has paid an enormous price for what he did. Colin Kaepernick also had 25, 30, 35 million dollars in the bank of you know, guaranteed money. Paul Robeson got destroyed by the United States government to the point where he was essentially erased. If you read the New York Times obit of him in 1976, 75, 76. It was so filled, you could tell that whoever wrote that was like, I don't want to write a single word of this. I mean, he was destroyed, which is similar to what you see some of these organizations doing to Kaepernick now, that they, don't, they want to deny everything of him. So that's why I thought it was really important to revive Paul Robeson. One of the things that one of my favorite people and he would never accept me calling him a mentor, but I consider him one. Your father, David, said to me a long time ago, he said it to everybody, but I thought he was talking to me directly. <laughs> he was in the middle of an auditorium at UMass, had a bad back at the time, he was really struggling, but he hung in there. And he said, history writes people out of the story, and it's our job to write them back in. And so that's why I thought it was really important to start this book with Paul Robeson. Because when you compare what is happening, what happened to Robeson and what's happening right now, where you do have a government, you have a government that has gone out of its way to destroy an individual. I mean, let's not forget, Ruth Bader Ginsburg went out and called Colin Kaepernick dumb. 
you know? So there's a lot of feelings, you know? And she had to apologize, because we all apologize now when we get caught. But, um, you know, but when we think about this, how different is it? And so the power of the individual is becoming less and less and less, and it was never very big in the first place, as the power of the corporation and the power of the government and the power of the government and the corporation become one in this age of privatization. You know, what chance do you have? And how different is that than doing, you know, than what happened to, to Paul Robeson back in the 1940s? Thank you all very much. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I, go on too long. I didn't mean to go on too long. How long did I go?